thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm always just so appreciative that you come every single, um, every single week when you come. We are, we are in our second to the last series, second to the last sermon in our manifesto series. Um, and that means it's the penultimate, if we can use that word, which we don't get to use very often. Um, I like big words. I don't know if you know that. But it's the penultimate, which means it's the almost to the last one, which we're really excited about. And we hope, that, we hope that the study guide has been something that's blessed you through this time. We just finished our study guide for our next series called Christmas Presents that's coming up. Um, I believe it starts on the 30th. And so I think we'll have those all ready for you by next week and ready to go. So um, that's a little exercise that's been, it's been fun for me as writing them. And it's also hopefully been a blessing to you as we continue through these series. And we've mapped out next year. We're ready to go for the preaching calendar for all of next year. We're really excited about it. We can't wait to see what God is going to do through all that. So um, thanks for being a part of this. Um, you know that last week, last week we dealt with some, some really phenomenal texts and some pretty heavy texts. Some of the texts from last week actually really connect with what we're doing this week. And so I just want to do a quick little roundup and a little um, um, just talking for a moment. And, and particularly, chapter 3, verse 11 was a pretty important verse. And so let me read it for you right now. It said, in this new life, it doesn't matter if you are Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric or uncivil slave or free, Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. One of my favorite texts in scripture and they're important for us to remember because we don't read the next text that we're about to read in chapter 3 verses 18 through chapter 4 verse 1. We don't read those texts without thinking about this text and in fact I even said last week who is Jesus biased against as an answer to this or as a, as a question that comes from this text? Who is Jesus biased against? And what's interesting is that I said, um, I said, listen, Jesus wasn't biased against anybody. But as I went back and I was studying, it made me think Jesus did kind of hit one group kind of hard. You know, he sort of hit the uber religious, the overly religious, and he kind of hit them. They took it on the chin every time. I think Jesus loved them. So I think it was rebuke, but it was pretty consistent, right? The reason why is because the uber religious or the over religious have gotten the order of things wrong. And this all relates to the text. We'll get there in a bit, but it's important that we talk about this. The over religious have forgotten that God is the point of religion, not them, not religion itself. Perfectionism, legalism, all of those things are poor theology. We call them meology. They lead back to the practitioner rather than to God, rather than leading back to the point and the object of our faith, which is Jesus. Now, it's a binding to something less than God, less than Jesus, when we bind ourselves to religion and not the God that religion is supposed to be expressing. When we bind ourselves to religion and its practices, we're binding ourselves to something less than God, but when our binding is to God, our religion becomes beautiful. It comes alive. It's filled with glory and it's filled with mystery and splendor and it's beautiful. Religion is supposed to show what we're bound to. But when we're bound to it rather than to God, religion can become something that becomes very hierarchical. It can become something that can become oppressive. It can become something that it looks inward towards itself. When it is bound to Christ, it becomes this beautiful expression. What does this have to do with the text for today? I know it seems like I'm on a little bit of a diatribe here and I don't mean to be, but we have to take these texts that we're about to study seriously enough to make sure that we see them in the light of everything that's happening in the book of Colossians. Remember, Paul is writing, Paul is writing to a... Um, a young church that has been distracted, that has kind of dethroned Christ from the, his throne of grace and said he's less than. They're listening to these, these heresies of Gnosticism and mystery religions, and they're fighting that. Paul has been trying to give them a new identity within Christ, speaking so powerfully in chapter 1 and chapter 2. And now in chapter 3, he's trying to get us to understand how we express who we are now that we understand Christ. We believe that we are Christ's manifesto. We are Christ's declaration to the world. So it is important that we know how to speak of Christ and of course how to live in Christ as well. And Paul is telling us this. And now we're about to get to a section that's called the Hausstelfen, which is German, which just simply means the household codes. 
Martin Luther named this section of Scripture this particular thing, and everybody pretty much accepts that this is the word for it. But it's a household code, and there were household codes for the Roman world, right? This is how the Roman household system works. For the Jewish world, this is how the Jewish household system works. For the pagan world, this is how their homes and their households, estates, whatever you want to call it, work. And this one is particularly Christian, but it's particularly Christian in a very specific way. And so there's four things that you have to think about when you lean into this text and when you study it. By the way, if you don't know what text we're about to study, if you've been doing the study guide, you know. If you don't know, this is the wives submit to your husband text that we're about to take in. All right? Boy, some of you guys are bold laughing at that. Um, you're like, ha, 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 ha. Honey, your wife's like, no, no. Because, and I understand it, like this, Colossians 3, Ephesians 5, 1 Corinthians has it as well. This list that you go, okay, what do we do with? How do we handle this? And so we're going to take scripture really seriously and see what it's really saying. It's really important. But there's four things that we need to lean into to understand what we're talking about, what Paul was talking about to make this a Christian household list. So it begins like this. The first thing that Paul assumes when he writes this list is that he's talking to people, not property. And the reason why that's important is because wives, children, and slaves were all considered property at the time. And so he says, listen, this addresses people who would normally be seen as property, but he deals with them in a matter that elevates their status, right? He's saying you are not property, first of all, because he's addressing them at all. And he addresses them in their elevated status that he's giving them in this note. The way he does that is by addressing them first, not last, so what does he say? He says, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, don't treat your wives harshly. And we'll get to that in a second. But he addresses the woman first because he acknowledges that she is a person, not a piece of property, and that she's important in her own right. He's flipping the script on everything that people thought at the time. And then he addresses them in their elevated status. He addresses them first. And then he talks to them as if what he's asking them to do is a choice, not a charge. Wives, submit to your husbands as if you have a choice. And we'll get more to that later. And then when he addresses the men. So what you've got is you've got, you've got these three people. that Their status is being elevated. Wives, children, slaves. And then you've got the husbands. Husbands, fathers, slave owners. By the way, they all would have been the same guy in a household. Because in a Roman household, there was this idea of paterfamilias, right? There was the idea of, um, of the, house, the head of the household who was responsible or was entitled to all the property that was there. But as Paul deals with them, he says, listen, these things that I'm asking you to do are a responsibility, not a right. To the men, he's reminding them that this is a responsibility from God, not a right or an entitlement from their position or status or station. So you take those four things and remember them as we read these texts because they're very important. So let's begin, shall we? Colossians 3.18, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. And, and, and a lot's been fought over here, right? This has been used to systematically oppress women within the church and to systematically oppress women within the home, which is absolutely not, I believe, what Paul was trying to do at all. And one of the things he says is, listen, there's a choice here, and it's because it's connected to the lordship of Christ in your life right? Submission, which we get hung up on. And, and let's just for a moment think about that word. This word submission is not a theological statement. It is a practical statement that Paul is making to the women. He's not saying God wants you to submit. He's saying, hey, women, submit to your husbands. So the question is, do wives have a choice to submit? What, Paul, Paul, by Paul giving them some options, he's opened the door a little bit to some equanimity, which he hadn't, which hadn't been there before, right? And what's interesting is that in, in the Roman household, the paterfamilias, the father, if you will, the head of the household was in charge and owned everything. Very rarely was that challenged. It sometimes was challenged in court if the person was a horrible person or if they died and the woman needed to be in charge because there was no other, um, there was no other male to be. They would sometimes sue for the right to be head of the household, but very rarely would that happen. You know, these hierarchical, hierarchical relationships were the norm. And, and Paul's trying to say, how do you live inside these hierarchical relationships that 
and, and still hold Christian value and virtue in the middle of it. Now, I'm going to use an illustration here, and it's kind of the opposite illustration, so stick with me. We have a tendency, there are times that we think, okay, Paul is speaking into this, so he must agree with this system that is there. I would argue that that's not necessarily true, right? It's, let me give you a for instance. My, my children, whom I love, sometimes when I talk to them, are on their cell phones. Sometimes. And sometimes they're actually like have their AirPods in while I'm talking to them. And so there will be times where I will say, hey, could you maybe, and I'm usually this polite, maybe could you take that out of your ear because we're talking. You know what I'm not saying? I'm not saying you should never use a cell phone or the system of digital technology of communication is bad. I'm not saying all that stuff. All I'm saying is, hey, right here, right now, can you take those off so we can talk? Right? In the same way, kind of the opposite, it's kind of an opposite illustration, but in the same way, Paul is not saying, I am so glad that we have these hierarchical situations. You should absolutely live within those because that's exactly what God wants. Nowhere does he say that. He says, this is the reality. I've got to speak into it. So that's what he's doing. And we'll get more to that later. But this submission that we're talking about was not without context, right? Because what he was saying is, by the way, submit to your husbands, but you know that you don't belong to them. You actually belong to God. You are not your husband's property anymore. You are God's property. There's been a transfer of ownership and that's really important, right? To know where you come from and who owns you. A, a, good, a good text to realize our transfer of ownership is Colossians 1, 16 and 17, which you should probably know quite well. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things that we can see and the things that we cannot see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He's basically building a provenance for everybody. You know what provenance is? Have you ever watched Pawn Stars? Nobody admits to that but it's a very popular show. So I think some of you are lying. That's all I can take. People watch posters. So what happens is somebody comes in and they've got a signature from John Lennon or something, right? And they'll come in and they'll be like, this is a signature and it came from my great uncle and this and that. The first thing they do is they have to establish provenance. Where does this really come from? Who really owned this? And so they bring in experts and they go, yeah, it was this, yeah, it was that. And, and like, it's amazing when somebody brings in something that they think maybe it's worth $300 and it's worth 30,000. That's the best. Most of the time, people think it's worth a couple thousand and they're like, that's not worth the paper that it's printed on. Like it's worthless because they can't establish provenance. What Paul has done in this scripture is he has established provenance. He existed before anything else. He holds all things together. Everything is Jesus's. Everything is God. And the transference of ownership is the key to understanding this text. Wives, you don't belong to your husbands. You belong to God. But it is your husband, so why not love him? Right? And then he says the same thing to the husbands. He says, husbands, love your wives. Never treat them harshly. Right? Why is he saying this to the husbands? Because husbands were treating their wives like property, even in the church. And that wasn't to happen anymore. And this is Paul giving them a, he's like, come on, let's, let's move you. Let's transfer you. Let's convert you from vice to virtue. It was no longer your property. You just became a steward, not an owner. The rules have changed. Have you ever driven your friend's car that's way nicer than yours? No, I mean, like, they have a really nice car. So, so I was traveling somewhere, I was hanging out with a friend, and he goes, hey, you want to see my new car? I was like, yeah, I want to see your new car. And so we walk through his house, and we walk, um, we walk past his gym, because he has one, and, uh, and we go to a, a garage I didn't even know he had. He had an extra garage. Just his house is that big. And uh, so he opens the door. I'm like, oh, that's a guy. He has this Porsche. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Very particular Porsche, right? 2006 or something, 2007, 911 turbo. It's, I don't understand Porsches that much, but this one apparently is a very well sought after Porsche. Less than 5,000 miles. Like the beautiful. He's like, you want to drive it? I'm like, no. <laughs> Come on. You know, if I'm going to drive that car, I'm going to drive it like, like an old grandma. But not like an old grandma that drives in our parking lots, because you guys are crazy. <laughs> right? But like an old, like I'm going to drive it like somebody who's very timid because it's not my car. And I'm pretty sure that if I broke that car, it costs more than everything I have. <laughs> like I'll have to sell my children and they will just have to carry this person around. <laughs> 
Because that's how much, I don't know how much it is, but it's definitely, it's, so, so like, he's like, do you want me to drive it? I'm like, yeah, because you own it and you can abuse it and it's your thing. So he get, we drive, that thing was amazing. It was the most visceral experience. It goes so fast, I couldn't believe it. But if I was driving it, I have to be a good steward of somebody else's property. Do you see what I'm saying? The transfer of ownership is the important part of this scripture. Because when you're a steward of someone else's stuff, a different kind of care is required. From possession to stewardship means our status has changed. Paterfamilia, you're head of the household. Ah, no, you're taking care of somebody else's stuff. It's not your property. So you need to care for it differently. So why still use this pattern of relationships at all? Let me tell you why. Because cross-cultural communication is a missiological imperative. You want me to, I'll use different words. <laughs> cross-cultural communication is really important. Let me give you an example, right? I'm in, I'm in Holland. I'm in Holland and we're, um, I'm speaking and I've got a translator and he's kind of right with me and I'm speaking and I start to use some very California illustrations. And I was like, yeah, I was surfing. I was so stoked, man. I was getting tubed. I was inside the crawl. I'm in the green room. And like the, 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 the translation was slowing down <laughs> to the point where he's looking at me like, uh, I don't really understand. And then a guy in the audience, he's translated something and the guy in the audience goes, no. And then they start arguing. Which, by the way, when you're speaking and you don't know the language, now they're having a conversation about something that maybe I said. Or maybe this guy's not saying the stuff I said. Maybe he's preaching his own sermon. Which, by the way, I've had that happen to me before. I preached a sermon one time and a guy came up to me afterwards and was like, hey, just so you know, translator didn't like your sermon. He preached a completely different sermon. Yeah, that happened right up the street. I'm not going to tell you what church, but it happened in Loma Linda. Um, fascinating, fascinating. I was like, oh man, I wish they would have told me. I just would have halfway through would have been like, nah, I'm going to Pollock. <laughs> Finish it up. You got this handled. No, so this guy's arguing with the guy and then the guy in the audience stands up and walks up and he's like, taps the guy on the shoulder like, nah, I got this. The guy goes sit down and now I have a new translator. <laughs> And I don't really know what's happening because they're having this conversation in Dutch. And I'm like, well, hey man, what's going on? And he goes, yeah, he didn't really understand anything you were saying. And I'm like, why not? And he's like, because he's never been outside of Holland. Like he's never surfed, but he has no idea which time. I used to live in California. Go ahead. And he's like, but don't use the word stoked. They don't understand what that means. And I'm like, dude, I was stoked. And he's like, don't use the word dude either. You just sound stupid. It's like, I don't know who you are. So I don't know what he said for the rest of the sermon, but I couldn't speak, when I was in Amsterdam, I couldn't speak about surfing in the same way. My California-isms didn't translate into Dutch. Cross-cultural communication is a missiological imperative. To impact a culture, you have to use the language and patterns of the culture. So this week I was on the phone with a pastor in Japan. They've asked us to plant a church in Japan. Um, in Tokyo. I don't know what that means. Yeah, no, it's cool. <laughs> you can clap for it. It's super cool. And he's like, okay, so what would you do? And I was like, man, I don't know. And then he looked at me like, why am I talking to you then? And I'm like, I don't know what I would do because I don't, un I don't know that I understand the culture that well. Can we have a conversation before we talk about what I would do? I mean, I know, I know what we do out here, but before I can talk to you about what, what I would do, can we talk about the culture and what the needs are within the church and in the, the culture, the Japanese culture. And so we talked for an hour, hour and a half about that because cross-cultural communication is a missiological imperative. I have to be able to speak into the culture. Paul was speaking into the culture, but here's what's funny. People have said to me, I've actually heard this. People have said, listen, if, if, if Paul, if God didn't want, if God didn't want there to be slavery, then God would have done away with slavery. But see, Paul talks to it, so maybe it didn't bother God so much. Like, what? I was, I was, I was very, like, uh. but, but here's the thing. That's, that's not true. In 311, Paul spoke to it. 
He said there's now no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free. He got, he already did away with all of it. But he also understood that there's a predominant culture that he's probably not going to, probably not everyone's going to be like, yeah, that makes sense. I'm just going to like let all my possessions go and not worry about, of course that's not going to happen. So he's spoken to the culture in a way that they could understand, right? So he wasn't, he didn't agree with the culture, but he had to speak in a language that made sense in the culture. But do you understand what he's doing? He is eviscerating the culture. Wives, you're not possessions. Children, he says this in 320, he says, children, always obey your parents for it pleases the Lord. Now here's what's interesting. They, uh, this word for obey is not as much of a choice as the submit word, just so you know. <laughs> Boys. Um, it's, it's still like, it's a little more of a directive than the other one, just to be clear. But, um, but it, he does still give some choice. But he says, this is interesting. Listen, the consequence is God's, not the parents. Who does it please? He's not asking, he's not concerned if it pleases the parents. He's letting you know that it pleases God. Why? Because God is your parent now. Right? There's a transfer of ownership. When I was in my first church in San Diego, we had, um, we had a family whose daughter ran away. She was about 15 and a half and she ran away. And so we went to do a pastoral visit. I went with my associate, well, not my associate, we were both associates. We went there and um, we walked in. He was quite a bit older than me, had been doing this for a long time. And he's like, I got this when, I wa- when we walked in. He's like, I got this. And I was like, okay. Um, and so we walked in the house and he said, first things first, I want you to know this is not your child. I'm like, this is bad. This is, this is we're doing this wrong, it feels like. And he goes, no. He goes, no, that's not your child. That is God's child. He said, you've just been given stewardship over that child. So you need to know that God wants what's best for this child too. So this is not about you. This is about God and this child. And that's what we're going to pray about. It's brilliant. Never thought about it that before. Never thought about it that way before. Just for the record, you're still going to have to pay their, their college tuition. <laughs> or you can start praying right now. But, but I never thought about that before. I never thought about it that way before. And I thought, that's really interesting. I really like that. For it pleases the Lord. He's not worried about the parents. He's worried about the Lord. And then he says this, and this one I struggle with. I'm not going to lie. Fathers, do not aggravate your children. I thought that was my job. I thought I was supposed to just aggravate my children. That's what I was supposed to do. No, but he says, fathers, don't aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. Now, this is interesting because the second half of the phrase is actually not they will become discouraged in life. It's actually meaning that they will become discouraged in their spiritual walk. He, you see, he, Paul treats children as Christ's disciples. He elevates their status. They're not just position, they're not just possessions. It's not just, you know, to be seen and not heard or not even be seen anymore. Because oftentimes in the Roman culture, you didn't even really raise your children. Your slaves did. Other people raised your children. You couldn't be bothered because you were about the business of being, you know, in charge of everything else. This was different. Don't aggravate your children because they'll become discouraged in their faith. It's huge. And then he moves on to slaves and he says, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time. Not just when they're watching you, like be invested in this. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Now, this is a little bit of a different kind of slavery than like antebellum slavery that we think about in the U.S. I'm not saying it's better by any means, um, but it's a little bit different. It was a little more economically driven in some respects. Um, but, but what he's saying is, listen, we want you to mind the things above, not earthly things. This is important. And then he says, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. See, this is the admonition. You're no longer owned by these people because God owns you now. And if you don't believe that this is what Paul is saying, you got to remember that every time Paul introduced himself, almost every time that he introduced himself to, to these churches in the New Testament, every time he did it, he said, I, Paul, a doulos, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. He's putting himself under possession of Jesus Christ. This ownership thing was big for Paul, but he wanted you to know the ownership is happening somewhere else. Paul uses this theme all the time. 
And then he even says, because there's some people who just work for like the, a living, you know, they just work for the paycheck. Um, he says, remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the masters you are serving, the master you are serving is Christ. What he's saying actually is that even if all you are working for is a paycheck, know that the paycheck that's coming is much greater than the paycheck that you thought you would get. So even if you don't get a paycheck from the master that you thought you should be giving, it's okay because the, the actual paycheck that's coming is the reward that you get as an inheritance from Jesus Christ. So he's like, don't, you got to get your head out of this world and get it up into heaven if you can. And then he says, but if you do what is wrong, you'll be paid back for the wrong you have done. For God has no favorites. Now this is interesting because this, obviously you can be like, oh, God's wanting to, to create just, or, you know, to punish us. But, but think of it in the broader terms. He's actually taking away punishment from the slave owner as well. That slave owner has nothing to do. While inheritance comes from God, so does justice. And while it sounds bad, he's reminding them that the master is almost, his earthly master is almost inconsequential because God is the master now. And then he looks at the masters and he says, masters, be just and fair to your slaves. And I'm gonna say it this way. Remember that you're a slave too. You're a slave too. Again, it's the transference of ownership and it's the transference of status. See, here's the thing that is happening here. You've got women, children, slaves being raised up in status and you're getting fathers and, and husbands and, and masters raised, you know, lowered down in status. There's a leveling of the playing field and Paul does this all the time. There's no Jew, there's no Gentile. There's no slave, there's no free. He's lowering everyone's status. Why? So he can lift everybody up. And see, that's what we forget. And I'll tell you what, it's hard to go from boss to worker. I bet it's harder to go from master to slave. Some of us live our lives really interested in the status that we have in society. Whether it's the careers that we've chosen, whether it's the, the titles that we're given, we, we believe that position and status makes a difference. And we believe that the more we have and the more that we're responsible for makes us more important. And what I think is being said here is, hey, you don't get it. You're a slave, you're free. You just look the same to me, says God. You're a man, you're a woman, you just look the same. You're a Jew, you're a Gentile, you're just the same. You're these people that I created and I love dearly. I mean, when was the last time you recognized that God had changed your status in life? For some of us, it's probably incredibly, overwhelmingly powerful and positive that God changed our status. And for some of us, it's actually very difficult to accept the new status that God has given us because we feel like it's something less than because it doesn't come with all the, you know, all the cool stuff that we had before, to be a paterfamilias, to be the guy in charge of the whole household and to have somebody say, you know what? That doesn't matter so much because those slaves, they're not yours and you're owned by the same person who owns them. That wife, you don't own her. That wife, she's not your possession. That child, it's not your possession. So I mean, if you have a change in status happening, you begin to think, well, what is, what's my new status, right? What's my new title? What's my new label? What's my new category? What's my new identification? What, what am I now? If I'm not the things that I thought I was, what am I? And Jesus says one thing. Listen, you're a child of God. Amen. You're a child of God. That's all you are. And that's enough because that is actually an incredible elevation from who you were before. And, and can you imagine the first century church reading these words and going, what in the world? Because these are Christians that are reading this word, right? So there's slave owners sitting in church going, Whoa, wait a second. Everything that made me what I am, all the possessions that I have, all the things that I thought made me important, He's saying that they're not, that they're just as important as I am, first of all. And second of all, that all of us are the same under Christ? Come on, when Christ does away with the categories, all of a sudden we just have to live as a family together? Come on, what does that mean? 
That means your life is not what you thought it was. That means that your status is not what you thought it was. That means that everything that gave you importance in life is now incredibly not nullified. That's not the right word, but it's diminished under the importance of God in the universe. You see, the uber religious get things in the wrong order. But when you put God first, and when you put God last, and you put God in the middle and everywhere in between, you find a home. And that is a home that is in the house of Jesus Christ. You are a child of God. That right there is the greatest update to your status you could ever get. It is the greatest elevation that we could actually have in today's world at all. These texts have been so dramatically misunderstood that we've used words of God to oppress people. Come on, folks. We need to get over ourselves. There's no status on this earth that is greater than the status that God has given you as his child. Let's bow our heads. Jesus, thank you. Lord, thank you for leveling the playing field. Make me less important so that you may be the most important. Lord, may we see people as people, never as possessions. May we never oppress anyone by using your words. Lord, correct us when we're wrong. Give us a broader understanding so that we can be those manifestos, that we can declare you in our words and our actions, in the way that we understand one another, in the way that we understand our relationships to one another. Lord, may all of this be true and may all of this happen today, here, now. Soften our hearts if we've ever used your words to be oppressive. And Lord, may we be your declarations to the world so that people may know who you are and what your love is through us. In your name I pray, Lord. Amen.